All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming for the talk today. A uh, reminder that we will not have a colloquium next week, but we will have one the following week. That will be on a Wednesday. And then, unfortunately, no colloquium after that until November because I'll either be on leave or this room will be occupied for a whole week or so and we'll be able to have it. So um, keep your eyes open for the announcements. And, and a new newsletter, I think just about every week that we can have a colloquium is now filled. We're still negotiating one last one in December, but otherwise I think we will have a colloquium whenever we can. So today's speaker is somebody that I've known for quite a few years. Um, when I refresh PhD in the late 90s, my first job was as a contractor with Raytheon at the uh, PSAR over water, and that's where I met Tom, and we were both there working on the various things, and then the, the great migration, as we call it, <laughs> in the late 90s, when a number of us had to get shifted to new positions because of the problems with money, uh, led me to the Earth Science Department, and eventually led me out of there here. <coughs> and Tom went on to the data visualization department where he has stayed and found a nice niche. And uh, he's now going to show you some of the stuff they've been working on. So Tom, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, the, uh, you know, it was one of those transitions for me where I was always kind of interested in animation, but uh, dabbled with it a little bit in, in grad school and stuff. And never, but the group was, you know, they needed people with science background and had an interest in computer animation. And so it turned out to be, they were willing to take a chance on me. As one of the guys said, it's easier to teach a scientist about the animation tools than it is to teach an animator about <coughs> how to talk to the scientists. And, they, and <clears throat> I had experience with data formats and stuff like that. So we're in that, that weird little world between the hard science and education and outreach and, 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 and things of that nature where you want to try and communicate your scientific results in as clear a way as possible, usually to the general public, but we do have, we have done stuff for museums and schools and stuff like that. In fact, the group that I work for, the Scientific Visualization Studio at Goddard, all of our content and all, most of the stuff that I will show you here is available freely on the web. Some of it we actually have available is as raw, like TIFF image frames, so you can like encode any segment of it that you might want to make your own movie stuff like that for anything you might want to do for a talk or pre a presentation or for schools or anything like that. Um, and this is, a, this is my opening slide here just shows off some of the stuff, and this is mostly Helio stuff because that's my focus there. We've got a bunch of samples of some of the more recent stuff I did. Uh, this was actually built uh, so from solar magnetic field model, <coughs> a PFSS solar magnetic field model um, built from SDO data and evolved and then build, building field lines around it. It's actually animated, the new version of it. Um, mission, this is um, a mission that's supposed to be launching soon, but it's been delayed again, that's gonna observe the ionosphere, particularly the interface between what the magnetosphere dumps down onto the Earth's upper atmosphere and how weather systems percolate up to it. And this interface layer determines a lot about some of the space weather impacts on the ground. Um, one of the pieces that I did with um, the actual, uh, I think this might have been Sampex data, to build a radiation belt model and also threw in a little particle model that does the dipole, uh, the magnetic dipole and gyro motion of charged particles to kind of illustrate how radiation belt, belts work. And one of the things that I regard as one of the, the handful of things that, that I have done that I regard as artistic and mm. it was almost an accident. <laughs> So anyway, it's, it's kind of a, uh, uh, and I might tell you a little bit more story about that later. Um, <clears throat> basically what I want to cover, you know, samples of stuff that we've done, the kinds of audiences that we serve, the kinds of tools that we use. Um, our group, you know, we, we use a lot of commercial tools, we get, use a lot of open source tools. Uh, I do a lot of my stuff in kind of a different pipeline than a lot of my coworkers where I will use Python to pull the stuff together because years ago Paul Barrett dragged me in his little snake cult thing. <laughs> but but uh, and I've, been, I've, almost, I've almost programmed almost exclusively in Python for probably about 15 years now. So anyway, and I'll go into a little bit about some of the, the things you have to do to, to use some of these tools 
Some of that stuff is changing right now. The tool, the computers have gotten fast enough that some of these tools are actually evolving in, a, in some new ways that have not necessarily better implications for scientific visualizations, but different implications. Uh, some of the standards so, and some other little samples of some of the st simple stuff that I've done, ways to sort of like people can get started. And then I got a bunch of movies from the studio that I can show you. We can, I can tell you little stories about them or you can ask questions or whatever, however you want to do it. <clears throat> One of the things I, we like to distinguish in the group is the difference between what we mean by animation versus data visualization. Animation, we don't worry too much about the realistic scales of things. We want, might be presenting a conceptual op, um, view of something. Uh, you kind of see this stuff, models of the solar system where the planets are really big and stuff like that because you're trying to get make sure that people understand the relationships between things but not necessarily the realistic scales. Um, data visualization is driven more by the data, particularly the data that you're interested in, in presenting. Sometimes we bring in other data sets as well to, to establish a context, but, um, and, and we may even include some animation components, like I, I had the, uh, the radiation belt model with the particles. The particles weren't really to scale for their motions in that, in that visual, but it illustrated how particles were trapped in the dipole, and that was one of the reasons why I included it. Here was one of my very first visuals that I did for the studio, bringing together a bunch of different data sets. And this is, you know, it, it's still, in, in some ways, I regard it as, as a good piece. I wish I could do it in, in Ultra HD nowadays but, nowadays, but Soho doesn't have the resolution for doing that. But this was one of the first times anyone had seen a visual of all these different data sets brought together, synchronized in time and space. We've got the, the, the MDI that was in there initially, uh, just a visible light solar disk, the corona, the inner corona graph from SOHO, uh, switching to ultraviolet light, and then eventually into, into uh, x-rays. Uh, and bringing all these data sets together, you might notice early on, the time steps are about an hour and a half apart between each frame. Whereas once you're in close, it's a few seconds when you're seeing the x-rays form. So you have to deal with these transitions in scale. And that's one of the big challenges of scientific data visualization. If you're dealing with things, because there's such things that cross such fast scales, and sometimes there's something really small you want to look at that's moving really fast, but to set the stage so that people know what you're showing, you need to be able to start with a wide view at a, at a much different time scale so that people can see the stuff. So this was, like I said, this is one of the first pieces that I did where I brought one of the, this many data sets together. Um, and it's a piece that, I, that I'm, I still look at fondly because at the time, I was the first person that I had done something like this with, with solar data. Various audiences that we've worked with or have prepared content for, of course, schools and formal education sources. Informal education like museums and planetariums, we've done dome shows. Uh, there's one that we did a, a lot of content for called Dynamic Earth where you may have seen this case where you see the Earth sitting there and a big CME spreads out as particles and eventually strikes the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, that's actually a dome show. You're sitting there and it's like all happening around you. It's a really pretty impressive show. Um, it has been shown at um, Air and Space downtown and a few other venues. Sometimes we do stuff for the researchers when they're presenting uh, a science story. Um, right now, our, our major focus is if someone actually has a NASA grant that they're using to do something. We have a group of writers and, and some of the scientists that are sort of like keep their ear to the ground as to some new result that might be um, something we can do something really newsworthy on. And if there's a, a good visualization possibility for it, then we might be called in. And of course, the general media itself. Um, we actually had a piece, uh, one of our works that was used by the New York Times very recently of a cross section of the interior of a hurricane. I think it was, uh, was it Maria? I can't remember, it might have been Maria or it might have been one of the more recent ones. Our group actually covers a wide range of expertise. And now the <laughs> studio started with a lot of earth science, people doing earth science data. We would take like GOES data, sea surface temperature and map trajectories of hurricanes and stuff like that. This is actually a piece from the year we had uh, 27 storms, I think, 27 hurricanes that formed during the current season. They ran out of letters and had to go up to Zeta or something like that, I think, in one of the, uh, <clears throat> the storms. Uh, we've done stuff with planetary, um, Mars and MOLA data, me with Helio, 
uh, uh, lots of atmospheric stuff, and geospace. So I kind of cover the geos. I, my joke is I, I deal with everything that's from the ionosphere and up that isn't solid. If it's plasma, it's me. Yes. Uh, maybe I missed the very beginning of the introduction. Could you say, when you say we, the group, yeah. where, where administratively, where are you, and how many are well, you, and what are you? Okay, uh, actually, I'll have a picture of that at the okay. end. I got into, but yeah, we're at Goddard Space Flight Center. Okay. We're, we're sort of attached to the Office of Communications. Okay. Um, but we have, because of, of the resource types of resources we do, we have sort of tentacles and access to data products right. all over the center and beyond. And so that's where we get a lot of our, our stuff. But yeah, I, I'll be happy to answer more questions about that. Um, we always try to present our visualizations in a context, showing material. Well, a large amount of data, especially for Helio, has the challenge that you're trying to look at stuff that has no detect not detectable to the human eye. And that pre presents in itself interesting challenges. We try to tell in the context of a story. We try to bring in multiple data sets because you want to be able to say, hey, this happened over here and that caused that to happen over there. Sometimes that gets really challenging. In fact, one of our one of the folks we're working with, they're trying to correlate, I think, a disease outbreaks with El Nino. And that is not an easy correlation to see. Because uh, and because some, some and there was another another impact on there in another area of the world, and it was sort of like opposite impacts due to the same kind of event. So you know, it's, some areas got unusually wet and had more disease outbreaks. Some places got unusually dry. So there are other kinds of um, challenges in, in doing that kind of stuff. And, that, and those are problems that sometimes they're just really difficult to do. But we we try to deal with some of that. A lot of our data is time series. We rarely do static data sets. We try to do a lot of stuff with time series. We actually have a pipeline now where it puts together routinely uh, a lot of the um, image, the weather satellite images that are around the world and stitches them together into a texture that you can map onto a globe at any given time. So if you want to be able to show the Earth at a certain date historically, you can bring in the cloud cover too <laughs> for that date. And it's reasonably accurate. Sometimes there's little gaps in the coverage and stuff like that. But you, we're usually trying to bring in um, um, that kind of stuff. Camera motions and change of focus. Again, like for the, the earlier one, you might want to start out with a wide view so people understand where you are when you're trying to tell this story. Zooming into a location, changing both the time scale, the spatial scale, and emphasis on different things, changing the wavelength and stuff like that for for bringing in different data sets, and hopefully give you a little bit of a you are there feel. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we use now are tools that are used by computer animators, the guys that are doing the movies, uh, you know, like The Incredibles 2 and, and stuff like that. Um, the, and a lot of the special effects in a lot of the superhero movies, the Marvel movies and stuff like that is done by um, a similar set of tools that, that we've used. In fact, here's an example of some of the tools we're, we've been, well, we've been using them various times experimenting with. We use, most of our group uses a pro package called Maya that is a modeling package used by computer animators for pulling the data in. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of using a package called Houdini, which is what they call a procedural based rendering system. You sort of like plug pieces together. This was, this is a picture from one of my experiments trying to do the microprocessors in the Aurora. There's some atom, let's see, there's an atom and a molecule there, and that's a supposed to be a photon coming off. And I've just been, you know, playing with trying to use this very different tool to, to do new stuff. There is an open source pro product called Blender, which is actually freely available. I've been doing some experiments with that. One of the problems you run into with using these high-end tools, they're not made for scientists. They're made for artists. And, if you, and you've got to be able to bring your brain in to, to remap it a little bit in terms of how you think about things to try to use some of these tools. Because every one of them, they may draw a sphere, but the process in one application is very different than the process in another application. So you, 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 know, you have to sort of like know the tool. Um, another really cool thing that we have is a lot of these, the, the animation studios and stuff, have what they have, what they call distributed rendering. In other words, you may make a package, you know, you may lay out a scene and look, position the cameras and do your camera moves and your things will move around and stuff like that on your screen. And then you want to actually make the polished movie. 
you launch a process whereby each frame of this animation, you know, every movie is basically a sequence of frames, and it can take a snapshot at every time step and send it out to a different computer that will generate these frames. We have a total of about 100 re what we call render nodes that we launch to uh, to do some of this stuff. And you know, it turns a process that might take you know, a couple of days to render into something that takes a very short time because the, the job is basically split up. And, and it's, a, it's a process that's also sometimes called embarrassingly parallel because you can take one snap, full snapshot of your data and run it on a bunch of different things simultaneously. So that gives you, uh, you get that uh, extra uh, sense of, of scale there. And we've generated some pretty large products. I mean, one, one of the challenges we occasionally run into is the throughput on our network of pulling in the data for like a bunch of nodes simultaneously. For a while there, we were having some problems with it. You, it requires a lot of tuning to make these things play nice with each other. You know, you, you might say, oh, gee, my interface is frozen. No, it's because, you know, the machine over there is running some really big render and putting out frames that are 8K in size to write them to another disk. So you gotta have your networks really, you know, kind of tuned to handle that kind of throughput. <clears throat> Let me talk a little bit about what we kind of call the visualization pipeline. I talked about, you know, we take each frame and we spit it out to a render node to, to render. So uh, let me just kind of break that down as to what sort of happens in that, in that process. For each time step, when you want to break up your movie into <clears throat> little snapshots, we, which we call a frame or, or time step in your simulation, we start with, we, we find, identify what data is relevant for that frame. You know, whether it's cloud data for the Earth, it might be magnetospheric measurements or something like that for a satellite. Sometimes we'll do interpolation on that, although there, there's a little bit of a philosophical battle of if you're interpolating between two, two data sets, how much real data are you actually showing? So there's a, sometimes we run into these little philosophical battles of, of do you really want to interpolate a lot or do you want to do it? You know, it's, it sometimes can be the difference between an animation where things seem to smoothly change from one frame to the next versus them jumping. And sometimes that's important for your story, sometimes it isn't. And, and we have a lot of philosophical arguments about that kind of stuff. We convert the data to formats that are appropriate for the render. You know, the, the, the fancy packages that I showed you there, sometimes they'll take TIFF input and you've got data in, in uh, um, some other type of format, it might be FITS or something like that. We have to bring that data in, turn it into sometimes an image, uh, sometimes we'll bring in a 3D volumetric data set and we might build something like ISO surfaces. Or if you're doing what we call true volumetric rendering, where you're doing ray tracing right through the volume, <clears throat> we'll actually have to make like a giant data cube corresponding to the, the measurements in there. So they might be, you know, where a high value that you want to accentuate is a higher density point. So when the ray goes through it, it, it sort of gets more absorbed. So you can see that. So we have to convert those, each of those to um, an appropriate thing to bring into the tool. That is one of the other challenges that we run into is very often the intermediate data formats we use are huge for stuff. Especially a lot of earth science data, is, which is very dense now. I mean, we've got so many different measurements on the earth, you run a, mo a computer model and, and there's you know, billions and billions of points. So anyway, <coughs> we have to assemble the uh, components into, a, into the scene. Uh, most of the folks that I work with are, who are doing earth science, they're always dealing with Oh, it's on the Earth. Sometimes we actually have to worry about the issues of whether it's a geoid or not for some of the stuff because it's that precise when you want to br bring that stuff together. Uh, a lot of my stuff I have to deal with, and this is one of the original challenges that made me switch away from using the standard tools, <clears throat> was I found myself dealing with all these coordinate systems that are used by the geospace community. There's you know, the geocentric Earth inertial, the Earth-centered body fix. There's the inertial in space. <coughs> There's the um, a G GSM, GSE, which is uh, GSE, which has the x-axis pointed to the sun, the z-axis kind of in the plane of the, of the Earth's axis and slightly tilted, and things like that. So you, so you get these data sets in all these different formats, and you might have to bring multiple ones together and, and put them in. So you have to do those coordinate transformations. That turned out to be a real, um, in the early days when I first started doing this, some of those, uh, tools that I show you, it was really hard to write the stuff in that. You almost had to like, 
you almost had to write some of your astrometry programs into one of those languages like MEL and, and these other animation package specific languages, which no one wanted to do. And when I found out that I could do stuff in Python, I was sort of like, oh, well, why don't I sort of step around that? And so I, I, I have a slightly different procedure that I use for doing that. But <clears throat> you have to assemble all these coordinate transformations. Camera motion's also setting up a, a challenge. Generate the scene structure or file. You have, um, you know, again, these might be how your data changes with time that is important in that particular time step. <clears throat> And, 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 and one of the th formats that we use, for the tools that we use, we use um, Pixar's RenderMan software. <clears throat> and it has a file format that I sort of like call it 3D PostScript. You know, your PostScript you know, tells you, oh, write a letter here and at this line, at this location. Well, what is called a rib file is something that says, draw a sphere here, translate over to here, draw a plane here. And you have to write all those commands out to a file <clears throat> that will then be, be passed to the renderer to, um, to actually render an image. Call, call the renderer and render the image. This gets spawned out to our render farm, or sometimes you, when you're testing, you might do it on a, a computer at your desk. Are we done? Well, two possible choices there. If you're not done, go back, update your time, your, your <laughs> clock on there to go to the next frame. Do it all again. <clears throat> or otherwise, you're all done. You collect your, you have, hopefully have a directory out there with a bunch of images and you collect them together and encode them into a movie in MPEG or MOV or whatever uh, format you want. WMV, MP, MP4, um, MPEG4 is becoming kind of a standard for a lot of stuff now. It's supported by a lot of browsers and such. So it makes it a little bit easier. <clears throat> a lot of stuff is put out in that format, although we sometimes use others. <clears throat> so. Why would you want to do this? That, uh, so I'll go talk about what, what it, because we invariably get the question, well, gee, I'd, I'd like to, you know, my data, I'd love to be able to do something like that with my data. Make it, you know, you have to sort of like do a little triage there and decide what, what is the best stuff you have to show because you need to, it's, a, it's not a simple task and it's gotta be something you, you really want to do. You gotta really, you know, love that data set or something like that to make sure you have the motivation to complete it. <clears throat> Reasons why you want to do it, generates a better quality product. It handles the multiple in image scales and camera motion by resampling. Um, back when I first did the, the, anima the picture that I showed where I was zooming in on the sun, <clears throat> the, um, shortly after that, a couple of the scientists sent me some of their, the movies that they had made with IDL where they tried to do the same kind of zoom and of course, the problem you have with, with a language like IDL is it's sort of like the data is what it is. It's that particular size. You wanna, you wanna resample it or you have to go and put something kind of skewed, you have to go and hard code your resampling in there. So, you, so they would send me these things that had sort of like blockiness and all kinds of artifacts in them and such. Whereas a renderer actually puts the pieces together it actually samples a pixel multiple times. So it sort of does an average of everything that might be sort of protruding into that pixel. So as a result, you get a much smoother looking, smoother looking product. <clears throat> um, so many relationships in the data are not obvious. Sometimes seeing them together can improve your science. And this is really more important for, you figured out how to do it for one of your data sets and you want to start applying the same pipeline with other data sets. You want to be able to see it on, with something else. We've got, um, <clears throat> we've had actually a few cases where some of the, uh, when we first put together a, an animation, bringing the data sets together, science look at it and says, I didn't know that was gonna be at that location. There were, uh, one of the missions that I worked with when I put together a magnetosphere model with their spacecraft orbits, they found out the spacecraft passed a little further south of the area that they were interested in in their model. So they actually went and altered the orbit of the spacecraft <laughs> to, make, to bring it better into line with, it, with that, uh, with what that was showing. And that was a case where, you know, having the coordinate systems and stuff like that, because that was one where I had GSE for the, the magnetic field model, I think, or maybe it was GSM, and, and had to bring in the, the spacecraft ephemeris too. So they create all kinds of little challenges there. But, you know, that was one of the more interesting stories. Outreach, education and press releases, news and web news releases. For the general public, you know, 
the, most people are now getting used to the idea, you know, the, these between the action movies and the animated movies and stuff like that, people are getting kind of used to this. And, and you can present these conceptual ideas in a lot better way to communicate with the general public. And, you know, sometimes you can build up some, some good capabilities there. Um, and also utility. Sometimes, you know, we, we've all got that presentation that we've used over and over for years and there's that one piece that you use, you know, almost take whole cloth and move it from one to the next. Well, sometimes you have a story, if you've got a story and you're working in a given area and there's some visual you can develop that would help set the stage for the rest of your presentation, it might be worth doing that, to go through the pain of trying to, to learn some of these tools to do this kind of stuff. Um, so if it's going to be something you're going to have a lot of reuse for, it's sometimes very worthwhile to do. Okay, I'm going to go into a little bit more of the stuff about what it takes to do this kind of stuff. Um, just so you have a, a, a sense of what's involved. I will tell you, it was stuff that really, it was a challenge for me too, because for a while there I was making a lot of really dumb mistakes. But anyway, and this stuff is evolving too, because computers were a lot faster, are a lot faster now than they were when I started. And so as a result, the people that are generating the, the uh, computer rendering packages are getting um, a little bit more, uh, how should I say, physically based. So we're traveling through another dimension, a dimension of left-handed coordinate systems, photons that travel from observer to the emitter, and where transparency can be murkier than opacity. All, all the, th the terminology that you know from physics, if you switch over to computer, com computer animation, sometimes the standards are different. You know, what's that old joke, I love standards, there's so many to choose from. <laughs> well, you'll have to, you'll, you have to deal with that on there. <clears throat> Very often, physics uses a right-handed coordinate system. You know, the x-axis, what's the, the little, the little um, thing, x-axis goes into y-axis and makes the z-axis a right-handed coordinate system. Well, for various reasons, computer, a lot of computer graphics programs char started off with left-handed coordinate systems. One of the reasons being that it was easy for them to set, put the observer here have your X and your Y graph in front of you and can count Z as back into this volume where your animation stuff was. And a lot of stuff was written to that standard. Nowadays you'll find a tool where there's an actual preference where you can say, which is your X axis, Y, you know, how are you, what coordinate system are you using? And because a lot of them are going to more physics based stuff, there a lot of them are, are slowly starting to uh, change to uh, keeping Z up, although I, had an argument with the guys that, that, who, that do Houdini when I did one of their tutorials and I just threw in a Z axis up for, for one of them and everything went haywire and they were like, this shouldn't work that way. <laughs> and so they, they agreed and they reported it as a bug. Another thing <coughs> that is uh, really kind of important on here, we, we have you know, the physics-based model of how images are constructed. You might have a light source, some objects, <coughs> your observer sitting here. A ray comes down, bounces off the object, it goes into the observer's eye. Those are the only rays that you're going to get to see, that are going to make the image that you see. All the other rays from this light go off in some other direction and are never seen. You don't want to compute those. You don't want to burn up your precious CPU time dealing with rays that never get to your observer. So. In the good old days of computer, of, of computer animation, or maybe bad old days, whichever you <coughs> depending on one's perspective, they did it backwards. This was kind of like the old classic idea that you vision work by, you know, rays were projected out of your eye, and then someone said, but why can't we see in the dark? So that as a result, the computer graphics model has it that the observer actually sends out rays, and then you have to worry about how do they hit the light. Now, there are a lot of cool algorithms for optimizing this process, for building geometry and stuff like that so that you can see it where they sort of fill things in. Um, generally, it's very difficult to include certain time dependent or, or um, processes like uh, Thompson scattering where you know, the number of scatters you have it gets much more complicated because they, they go around in different directions. You may never see those rays, uh, but they actually impact things indirectly. One of the things that, that is starting to happen now with faster processors, 
and various algorithms for optimization, is they're starting to move to a more physics-based algorithm for doing that. And they do various tricks for making sure that they focus on the rays that actually are going to hit your eye. Yes? Remind me what Thompson scattering is. Uh, that's the sort of a simple electron-photon scattering. The, uh, the basic one, non-relativistic. Okay. Or Compton, scat Compton scattering in the non-relativistic regime. Maybe that's the <laughs> good way to think of it. So anyway, so we run into that issue. Another thing that they talk about a lot in computer graphics is a process called shading. Um, this is changing a lot now because, they're, again, the, the, the model is changing. But very often when you talk, when someone doing computer graphics talks about shading, they're talking about putting a texture or color onto the surface of an object. You have a sphere. You want to make it look like the Earth. So you want to put a map of the Earth on it. So you, you map those, the colors on there. And to the object. Sometimes you might include what is called an alpha channel, which allows sort of like you to see through. So in this case here, an alpha channel might let the light from the object that it's mapped onto come through, but put other textures over top of it. This is done for doing things like, uh, very often we will have um, earth models where, okay, we wanna show the land, but we just wanna show a regular kind of a flat ocean. Or maybe we have a, some special ocean data that we want to put in there. So you have to write a mask that sort of lets the data come through and puts the mask over it to make it look, make it look more like an Earth or something like that. So that's one of the, the issues you run into. Very often there are certain animation packages, and this was this drove me up a wall when I first encountered it. They don't think in terms of opacity, they think in terms of transparency. And of course they're sort of mapped oppositely. Uh, both of them, for computer graphics, people usually map between zero to one. For transparency, zero transparency means it's completely opaque. One transparency means you don't see it at all. Similarly, opacity, if it's one, then it's totally opaque. If it's zero, it's completely transparent. So they're kind of reversed. Uh, and also, again, opacity is not like the way astronomers are used to thinking of in terms of like optical depth and stuff like that. So that creates uh, some other challenges. And depending on who's done written the renderer, these behaviors may be implementation specific. So that's why I say, I say, you know, if you're starting to use a tool, get into it and learn to use it because you, the, sometimes the knowledge base is just not mappable to another way. If you have to change, start changing your tools you almost have to totally rewrite your brain. We also have other terminologies that, uh, and issues that we have to deal with. Ambient lighting, um, for old computer graphics programs, that was a trick for making, sort of including scattered light in your environment. Um, one of the things you oft, often run into is you, you put together a scene and you render it and it goes, it's completely black. Well. You might have just forgotten to put a light in there, or maybe you're not looking at your objects. Maybe your camera's turned wrong or something like that. It's always kind of useful to set your ambient light to a little bit of a level so that sometimes you can actually see which way you might be, be looking when you render. It, it creates some interesting challenge. One of the other big challenges we run into, especially for the space physics stuff, is the large range of scales. A lot of computer graphics renderers are still only single precision floats. Four bytes of precision in there. This creates a real problem if you have something where you want to be able to go from the surface of the Earth to the surface of the Moon, and you want to try to do it seamlessly. Now, there's a lot of places that they'll do the little trick. You know, if someone wants to zoom into the Earth from space, and they, they they pass through that cloud layer, so you can't see, you know, exactly where they transitioned it. We're we're kind of picky about that, and we we like to just as a challenge. Very often, we did a series of what was called the Great Zooms years ago when that we first started getting uh, some of these really high resolution ground imagery. We would do zoom ins from the Earth all the way down to the surface and look at a building that might have been, you know, like the White House or the Capitol building or the, the mall and various areas. We did other areas around the world for various conferences. And we, had, we started running into precision problems. We actually had at one point where you you, you had to worry about the fact you, you tried to match up a high resolution data set with a lower resolution data set, and you had to take into account the fact that the Earth was not a, 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 a full sphere. It was, you had to, to was it WGS 84 or something like that? I think some of the data sets were, were set on that convention. And 
Some of that is, is now changing. Uh, various renderers are now putting in more double precision stuff so you can do these scales automatically. Very often you have to do it as a, a trick of, of, of your coordinate transformations. Uh, Anti-aliasing, we've talked about that a little bit, talking about the blockiness because when, a, when a, you look at a, a given pixel in an image, it might have various pieces going across it and by taking multiple samples in that pixel, you can get a better average of, the, of the, what the actual color of the pixel would be. And also coordinate transformations, I've talked a little bit about that. <coughs> If you want to get involved with this, there's actually a few people that have done a lot with this. Um, Brian Kent at um, NRAO has done a bunch of stuff using Blender with his, his with large volumetric data sets. Uh, I think it's Jill Nyman at um, SAO has done some other stuff with Blender, but they've also started working with uh, Houdini, and that's one of the reasons why we're, our group started looking at Houdini as well. Is um, for this kind of stuff. Some of their stuff is a bit different, but these are Brian Kent and Jill Knight, I think it might be pronounced Nyman, um, have done a fair amount with that. And they have stuff kind of tutorial, they have the data sets available online, you can kind of use it to, to kind of get familiar with it if you actually want to do some of this stuff yourself. Various output standards. Um, when I first started at the studio, we were still doing stuff in standard definition, which is about 600, uh, four, 480 by 640 pixels, 640 horizontal, 480 vertical. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Everything is HD now. That was one of the bigger changes. I had to go and double check and make sure I had all my standards right. A lot of stuff is now HDTV minimum 720. We're doing a lot of stuff by default to 780. And very often, if we've got a really good data set, we'll do a ultra HD. But we've got a few things that are even being done at 8K. So, um, this, some of the challenges, of the, I mean, thankfully the computers have gotten faster and they're able to pump this kind of data through. There's some open source tools. We should, you, we've used what's called FFmpeg for doing a lot of the conversion where if you've got a directory full of frames and you want to turn it into a movie, we very often use that. Um, there's another tool called Handbrake, which is useful for translating between different formats. You know, one thing puts out MPEG-4s and you, someone says, I want a WMV file. Well, you can convert it there. So there's a lot of open source tools that are available uh, for this kind of stuff. And, you know, we, our group makes use of a lot of that wherever we can get it to work. Another little simple visual here. This was something that I did in a really simple package years ago called POV Ray. It's actually still available. And strangely enough, it is one of the few double precision renderers out there. Um, it's not easy to use. It puts out a file, you, you generate a file that basically, like I was saying, like what Pixar has, put a sphere here, put a plane here, you know, and, and build that stuff in your 3D space and then tell it to render. Put this, put this color texture on the object. So this was actually a, a little charged particle animation for um, in magnetic and electric fields. And it was something that I was able to actually, I've got, got a Python particle simulation program that I use in, to generate this. So it's, 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 it's stuff that sometimes you can do surprisingly good stuff with very simple um, tools. But yeah, it was pretty much, except for rather than pop ray, it was Python all the way through. A lot of technical challenges. Getting your data and images properly co-registered. You want to make sure that if they're, one, one of the, the things we run into, which we haven't really quite solved in the space weather situation, someone says, oh, we want to show this spacecraft going through the region in, in the magnetosphere where there's magnetic reconnection. And they got me a bunch <coughs> of vectors that ride along the spacecraft. Well, it's easy enough to show those vectors, but if you've got a computer model that shows where the reconnection event happened, the odds that you're actually going to get that computer model to generate that reconnection event at the same location <laughs> is really low. Um, and so we, have, we run into that challenge. Sometimes our, we generate things that will show the simulated data. This is what we expect to see. And then we have to go and, and do the data as something separate. Um, time synchronization, artifacts introduced by multiple da data sets. The uh, thing, piece I showed at the beginning, the, the um, 
the Rusty data, I can't remember what the resolution was of that. There was a trace imagery at the very, near the very lowest level that was taken at like 12 seconds apart, each image. The EIT data for SOHO was taken two minutes apart. They were both ultraviolet images. The, um, the LASCO images were taken like 45, anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half apart, depending <coughs> on the images they were using. And bringing those into sync. We've had, we've had the condition at one point, and, and this is just the standard that I've chosen, and someone else can, can feel free to choose a different standard. I say that at any given time, the image that you use is the one that immediately preceded the time you're, you're, you've set your clock for. So that you, you, you know, that's my convention. I just do it because it's, it's easier to code up on a lot of things. But you know, there might be various applications where that, where that produces a problem. Physical scales and render precision, precision. I've talked about that a little bit. There's also other interesting limitations of the render. We have this, this case where you, know, you might be flying along and there's something that is a plane object and suddenly as you're zooming along, it goes edge on to your camera. And all of a sudden the renderer goes, I can't <coughs> see anything here, but it sort of knows there's something there. There's other data structures that says, there's something here, but I'm confused by this. And you, you know, you'll, you'll have this happen. I've got a bunch of uh, animations where I, I'm zooming in on the magnetosphere and, as you, and I have this paraboloid surface that I use to represent the magnetopause. And as my camera passes through it, the frame goes crazy, it takes you know, forever to render, you usually have to kill it. You know, so as a result, there's this little jump of one or two frames in a lot of my animations of the magnetosphere because you pass through that plane and the renderer goes crazy. Um, volumetric data sets, these are very time consuming. Um, the studio has actually experimented with some techniques for trying to make these less time consuming by doing things where instead of ray tracing through a fuzzy volume, you actually have a data point with a sphere or something like that that represents an object at different times. <coughs> Using camera motions, um, if you're moving across radically different scales, it's really difficult. You know, when you're out there, you know, they, they always make it look so easy on Hollywood. You know, they zoom, zoom in really close to a planet. It's really hard if you want to do that at realistic scales. Because if you want to zoom in and, and move that last hundred kilometers when you've been previously moving a million kilometers in a second, the splines and the precision don't always work out. But there's little challenges there. Multiprocessing and pipelines. If you're doing this a lot, you probably want to set up a pipeline. But if you can share it among other machines, you know, uh, there was always various jokes that, at, at one time or another that um, early on when I went to the studio, our render farm was actually the, the machines on someone else's desktop. Usually you hope they weren't there when you were using their machine for rendering, but not always. Um, but those are challenges like that. We were fortunate we eventually graduated to a dedicated render farm. So anyway, some of the challenges that we're dealing with right now. Keeping ahead of what the scientists can do on their desktop. Uh, if you've used some of these uh, modern tools like Visit, which is put out by Lawrence Livermore, uh, there's one called Myavi uh, that uses a, uh, another package that I've used occasionally that, that does stuff, where it does stuff kind of interactively, and they do pretty darn good. They can, some of them can do very nice volumetric stuff, and in fact, when I was having a problem reading one data set, making it so I could load it in through into my stuff, I, I sort of cheated and, and used Visit and said, I want a snapshot of this data layer here, and then I'm gonna put, I'm gonna use my fancy stuff and put an earth in the right position and stuff like that. And it worked out pretty good. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty nice looking animation. So, but we still have that challenge. The scientists can do a lot of stuff on their desktop now. The tools, the scientists tools evolved too. Um, we are using commercial rendering software. We actually have a license with Pixar, which gives us the ability to sort of drag their ear whenever we have a problem. Scientific users are not their primary customers. So we have been dealing with them lately. They've been making these big changes with making their stuff more physically based. And they're, we suddenly say, oh, that breaks the way we did this, or that breaks the way we did that. And we've got this, and you know, a lot of studios, when, when, well, when a movie is made, a lot of studios, you're starting from scratch. You know, they, they, they say, okay, we're gonna use this package, we're gonna do, do this stuff and they start building all their models and everything from scratch. 
We don't work that way. We have a lot of stuff that we have built up over the years that as the tools have changed slightly, you can sort of improvise and change it and make it work with the newer stuff. But if you make too much of a radical change at a low level, it really breaks a lot of stuff. Um, one of the problems we're having, uh, Pixar got rid of what we like to call opacity. I use what, um, certain types of things a lot because so many of the things that I render in, in my stuff, like magnetic field lines and orbits and stuff like that, they are non-physical things. And this is another philosophical argument we sometimes get into at the studio. So I try to make sure that my non-physical things, like orbit trails and stuff like that, spacecraft doesn't really leave an orbit trail. It just marks out a path. I try to make them respond to light differently than a realistic object. So that's one of the things that suddenly I'm having problems dealing with, with, with that. Um, Pixar has been listening to us on a lot of these complaints, but you can hardly do anything now where you don't hit something that we find out they've changed. And they are, they are pleased that they can say, hey, our stuff is used for all this really cool scientific stuff. They like being able to say that, so they're willing to listen to us. I'm not sure how much longer that's going to last. So anyway, in fact, I've even, and you know, part of this is, again, the rise of the physics-based renderers. You would think that physics-based renderers, people want to, you know, would be more appropriate for scientific stuff. Not necessarily the case, um, you know, because again, they 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 want to see things in a photorealistic way for the movie. They want you to, you know, when when that spaceship comes crashing down and you know knocks all the dirt aside and stuff like that. They want all that motion to be, you know, look realistic and be totally believable. But in the process, they've done a lot of things that make that more challenging for stuff. For those of us who are trying to illustrate stuff that you can't normally perceive, and so. That, that's one of the challenges that we've, been, that we've encountered right here. And this is, this is a photo, this is a group photo of our group. Uh, only one or two people that have left since then. But uh, yeah, Horace Mitchell is the director of our group. Um, this is the guy that did the, the Eclipse animations. Uh, we got several programmers that manage our web and database system. Uh, most of the rest of the people here. This guy runs our, does our hyperwall software. We got two system administrators that, that we give all kinds of grief to um, for keeping our stuff running with the NASA security environment and stuff like that. So there's a lot of challenge in there, but I'll tell you, it's a great group of people to work with. I've worked with them for nearly 20 years now, and um, we get a lot of stuff done, but we have a lot of fun doing it too. So that's the end of my formal presentation, and uh, let's see, I'm getting close to. The end here. Let me. Uh, I'm just going to put up some movies, and I, we can either answer questions about it, or you can ask other questions. Uh, let's see. Open with DLC. Um, and I'm just going to run through these here. Here was an example of uh, dealing with Solar Dynamics Observatory. This is all the different types of products that SDO puts out on a different screen. This actually, we have a hyperwall that's three by five, and this is the layout that we use when we want to show off SDO data. For a long time, this was the only way you could do it. This all data is all synchronized up, so you're seeing there, the sunspot there corresponds to the active regions in all these other places. And so the data, you know, and, and then we actually had, you know, the squiggly lines of science, like there's one uh, uh, spectrometer that's um, on board there that shows it for the, the same matching time. I actually had a conversation with a guy that was talking about how his museum, he shows these images, and at some people he think, walk away with the Im image that they're seeing different stars. <laughs> at which point I said, then you need to see this animation. There's a whole story behind this animation. It wasn't originally meant to, to, to be this. I was originally trying to show the difference between the photosphere and the chromosphere in SDO images, which is only about eight pixels wide, by the way, on this scale. But I was trying to see if there was anything interesting in it, and in the process had probably what I still regard as the most artistic animation I've ever done. Because this thing has actually popped up in a lot of different places. Uh, came across it, uh, it's been published in magazines, a lot of places picked it up. But one of the coolest things is as, you, as each filter passes over a region, you see how different a given region of the sun looks in the different wavelengths of light. And one of the people in the space weather thing says, I use this all the time to illustrate to student interns and students coming in 
why we look at the sun in different wavelengths. You see the big filament there, it's bright in one, it's dark in another. And the really fun part is when the sunspot comes around on here. But th this was something that I was just trying to see this little difference over here. You know, you can barely make it out there. And it, uh, it was, you know, turned into this piece. And, and you know, I, st I still enjoy showing it off and talking about it. I was hoping to get one of the scientists to actually talk about, you know, the meaning of the differences and how you see the different wavelengths here. But uh, never really been able to get that to, to happen. Watch the sunspot as it comes through here. You see like a little arc thing moving there, just to, and then wow, you see more of the coronal cool. loops <laughs> as it gets in, into there. So, I mean, this is one of those things that, you know, almost each time I look at it, I, of course, I've looked at it so many times. I think it, the coronal holes look very different in one wavelength to another. Uh, I've got a whole page written up on this thing, so you can use it for like it. Hopefully, it could be used for educational projects. Let's see, like, let's see, will this work out? Nope. Let me move on to the next one. And feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to kind of step through these and. and uh, so, how do you decide on the colors? This was the official SDO color table. <laughs> they, 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 um, you know, the, the Soho guys had theirs. And then SDO launched, and they had theirs. And actually, for a while, there was a little bit of a battle on um, between Lockheed Martin, which operated the AIA instrument, and Goddard, because Goddard liked the, the, uh, the Lockheed Martin guys like this 304 image here, which looks very, you know, everyone likes to use it as their because it, it looks what you expect the sun to look like, you know, this nice orangey thing. Um, but they had a darker version of that that didn't look as good. Goddard had a much brighter color table, and so I, I went with that one. Um, here's some other stuff we've done. Uh, sea ice uh, um, changing over the course of, of, of a year. Um, there, I think this was an instrument that was actually trying to measure the thickness or the lifetime of, um, or how old the, the given ice was. But you can see certain areas where there's like chunks that are moving and stuff like that. And it's just a really cool piece. We've got a bunch of things where we've done the flows of the ice as it's melting off of Greenland and such and, and going out into the water. They started doing a bunch of interesting stuff about what's underneath the ice in Greenland. This is, oh, oh okay, this one's the age. This one's the age one. But it shows you know, how, how long has a given chunk of ice sort of been there as sort of a coherent piece. You see, I love some of the motions here. You see as the stuff comes down or comes through the various channels. And of course, what was it? The Northwest Passage, which was up through there, that has recently become open in the summer. Here's one where we combine a bunch of different data sets where it's rainfall and fires and the correlation between this is, this goes into some of the issues that I was talking about about trying to show the interrelationships between data sets especially when you're looking at stuff on a global scale I think each of these pixels here corresponds to actual fires each one of these little circles whereas the color is I believe just the uh, temperature or, or something <coughs> oh no wait fire weather index okay that's their their index of what's the probability of a fire so, and then precipitation with the uh, cloud data, a bunch of different satellites. You can see some of the cases the satellite data doesn't go above certain latitudes. But yeah, a, a lot of our group does earth science. Oh, okay, here's the temperature, temperature reconstruct, global temperature reconstruction going back uh, to eight, I guess their first date year was 1800. But yeah, you see, the, you know, it, it warms, but not uniformly. There's some areas that seem to get a little bit on the colder side, and some areas get on the warmer side, depending on the fl flow of ocean water and stuff like that, that that may carry heat in and out of certain areas. Look at the Antarctica down there. It's got this really warm spot next to a really cold spot. Into the northern hemisphere, because the because so much of our um, temperature is controlled by the ice up there reflecting the the light. It's, it seems to be warming. This, I believe this is Joseph, I believe. We have a satellite pass over it. And then here's one of the ones I was talking about where they actually use little spheres to do the volume. The blue ones are ice, by the way. High altitude ice formation. And then the uh, colors in there is the, the rainfall intensity. We do a little slice on it. There's like, 
on the order of tens of millions of particles here representing these, these raindrop, me these precipitation measurements at different altitudes. And so they can take a very long time to render, but they've actually got some very cool techniques for doing, for doing that kind of stuff. What database did you use for those global temperatures? Um, it's, I don't know the exact one for that. Uh, it would probably, if you go to the animation page, it probably has that information because we try to keep a, a good um, provenance of, of where the data comes from. Um, we don't have direct links. This is one, a guy got a simulation of a melting snowflake. And so this is why actually one of the few microprocess ones our group has done. Uh, oh yeah, tour of the, of the Earth observing fleet out to L1. So we've got Discover sitting out there. It has kind of an irregular halo orbit because I think it does some little boosting or something like that. We've got the moon. Uh, and then, and this again illustrates the challenge of the different scales. Again, and again, this was all done as one animation. We didn't do any, you know, quick transitions between different scales when, when we do this trick. But, so we go down, we're along the L1 point between the sun, the sun and the Earth, and then we zoom in. And here's a bunch more Earth observing, Earth observing fleet of satellites. <coughs> And there is one that I would like to do. I think I'm going to put it in there. Yeah. Hopefully, the audio will be will be visible here on the or audible on this on this here. I think it's the next one. Yes. Forty-five years ago, Apollo eight astronauts Frank Borman. This is one of the polished pieces our group has produced. But this was a very, the guy that did the eclipse did this. The first to witness the magnificent sight. Earthrise. Now, for the first time, we can see this historic event exactly as the astronauts saw it, thanks to new data from NASA's Inner Reconnaissance Orbiter, or Oops. LRO. Ah. Oops, sorry about that. LRO's superb global lunar maps, combined with the astronauts' own photographs, reveal where Apollo 8 was over the moon, and even its precise orientation in space when the astronauts first saw the Earth rising above the moon's barren horizon. On December 24, 1968, a few minutes after 10.30 a.m. Houston time, Apollo 8 was coming around from the far side of the moon for the fourth time. Mission Commander Frank Borman was in the left-hand seat, preparing to turn the spacecraft to a new orientation according to the flight plan. Navigator Jim Lovell was in the spacecraft's lower equipment bay, about to make sightings on lunar landmarks with the onboard sextant. And Bill Anders was in the right-hand seat, observing the moon through his side window and taking pictures with a Hasselblad still camera fitted with a 250-millimeter telephoto lens. Meanwhile, a second Hasselblad with an 80-millimeter lens was mounted in Warman's front-facing window, the so-called rendezvous window, photographing the moon on an automatic timer, a new picture every This was a real effort on bringing all these data sets together. matched with LRO's high-resolution terrain maps showed that Borman was still turning Apollo 8 when the Earth appeared. It was only because of the timing of this rotation that the Earth rise, which had happened on Apollo 8's three previous orbits, but was unseen by the astronauts, now came into view in Bill Anders' side window. Here's what it looked like, as recreated from LRO data by Goddard's scientific visualization studio. You'll hear the astronauts' voices as captured by Apollo 8's onboard tape recorder, this is a really beginning funny with Frank Borman, transcript. now seeing the start of the whole maneuver. And you'll see the rising Earth move from one window to another as Apollo 8 turns. So 
they're matching the images taken from the command module with the LRO data here. The guy actually went and measured the I actually measured the windows to make sure he could accurately represent when they were able to see this <clears throat> on one of the mock-ups they had it got They had taken the, the iconic picture. <laughs> so that they were able to reconstruct. They listened on the audio for when the camera clicked and were able to sync it up. They had to do a lot of audio cleanup to do this. But this is this was a big up. They're actually looking at, at trying to soup it up a little bit more for the 50th anniversary coming up this December. But anyway, that's all I've got, that's all I've got in terms of prepared stuff. You can get a lot of all of our stuff, as I say, svs.gssc.nasa.gov. This and a lot of the other stuff that I've shown is freely available there. Feel free to, if you've got a presentation where you can use something, feel free. Um, and uh, thank you. <laughs> Didn't even use the pointer? <laughs> so, anyway. Really beautiful. Thank you. And again, it's a group effort. A lot of us, you know, almost all of us get. Um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. That's a, that's the picture I've got of, of your your telescope's twin in, in Charlottesville. <laughs> the picture I took of it. So that's in Virginia. This yeah. Particular yeah. Telescope. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, Is yeah. an Alvin Clarkinson refractor? Yes. Okay. Yeah, wow. refractor. Yeah. Yeah. You had a Are there other groups and other centers doing similar things? Yeah, um, a lot of us have our own specialization. Our group started out largely as earth science, uh, and then we moved into helio. I, every once in a while I do a little bit of astro, um, but there's a large planetary group at JPL, and they do a lot of stuff with like the Mars rovers doing the stereo reconstruction and stuff like that to build 3D you know, environments and such. Um, there's a group at NOAA that um, they do a lot of their stuff, but they try to script a lot of their stuff to post it on the web. Um, Where are the NOAA people? I think of, some of them are at Silver Spring, although I have corresponded. We're close to that. Yeah. Physically, <laughs> and I've been in there. Yeah, okay. But they don't, they don't do anything in, uh, in Colorado? Because when I I'm was not a graduate sure. student I'm a long sure. time ago, I used some of their products. Right. Uh, to do astro stuff. Yeah, the, yeah, that, and I actually access data over there for some of the Helio stuff that I do. Oh, okay. um, 
But anyway, yeah, it's, um, the, yeah, there's several other set, uh, areas where they do this stuff. Uh, um, NCSA has a group, and we've done some work in collaboration with them. The Dynamic Earth Dome Show was one of the things that we've done. Um, there's, um, let's see here. I actually, I knew that would be a question. I tried to put together a list, and then that's the major ones that I knew of right off the bat. A lot of other places have little, little small groups that do stuff. Um, and you'll find, you know, so, some of the stuff is done by, you know, some, some college departments where they got someone on the, that has done computer animation to do some stuff working with the science. So some co universities have small groups that, that do some of that stuff as well. So anyway, but yeah, I think ours is kind of like one of the, probably one of the larger groups. But we actually are more towards the public relations side, like the JPL group, they do a lot more stuff, but they, they actually are doing like the stuff that gets fed back more into the scientific work as well. You know, if you build a 3D environment for your rover, yeah, show that off to the public, but you also use it for, hey, we want to drive over there, you know, type stuff, but yeah. Is this picture some part of something else or why, why do you show this picture? I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to show it because I, you know, like I said, I, I, I it's your the sister scope of your of yours here, so I thought that seemed appropriate. <laughs> well, I'm from the University of Virginia. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think Ed Murphy, I think, was the one who showed who yeah. Who, yeah. who led us tour the observatory that time when I was down in that area. We were passing through that area on, on vacation one time, and so I got to see it. It was an un, it was an unexpected treat because we did not go down there hoping to see that. It just turned out the guy at the B and B knew. Ed and said, "Hey, I got this guy that does astronomy. He might be interested in seeing your observatory. Put us in touch with him." And we got over there. It was a blast. What is the aperture at the front there? I've used. I can't recall. I don't, I don't recall. I've used an eleven inch. It's, it's hit Paul in the head with it once. This, this, this is this is the one that you know. This is the one that uh, McCormick had commissioned to build at the same time the Naval Observatory wanted theirs built. And I know there was a little bit of politics going on there, which I heard the story about. And when Ed was telling me, I said, wait a minute, I've heard this story before, but from the Naval Observatory's point of view. <laughs> uh, well, so. There's a financial issue. That yeah, there was a, yeah. Primarily. Yeah. You have to pay for them. <laughs> well, McCormick had some financial problems and then paid yeah, for that, Yeah, yeah. Your, your focus really completely on the rendering, the final rendering process. And so, so, so if you have a, a, a scientist who has some data and mm -hmm. wants to, do, you know, where is the storyboarding? Who, do, do you help with that? And and, and, you're, and, and then, we, and, yeah. then and then and then a rough, a rough animation, yeah. and then a better yeah. animation. Yeah, and then, we, we go through. So actually, our studio to, yeah. studio studio is kind of odd in that regard. And this is another thing that's creating a problem with outfits like Pixar, who work with the big studios. In the big studios, the guys that make the surfaces for objects is a different group than the guys who do the camera motion and stuff like that. Very often, we're the one that you know we process it. You know, from the data all the way through to doing the camera moves, interacting with the scientists and stuff like that. It's very much very often a one or two person project, and so we will do. Um, so yeah, we have to kind of know the whole thing. Um, and that's, again, one of the challenges that, that the studio, studios, some of these animation outfits are making their stuff more for these studios that yeah. split things yeah. up among yeah. different people. And that makes it a little bit more challenging to do with, with some of the changes they're making in the tools. But um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, we'll do the storyboarding and, yeah. and, and things like that. And very often it's sort of like, like I'm dealing with one, thing right now where it's sort of like, okay, well, you're only seeing one side of the earth with this instrument. Don't look over there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> don't see the, the scaffolding behind the western town there. You don't want to look at that. So I've had to look at reprojecting the data and making sure I position my camera moves and stuff to present the data as it is to reliably, but not try to show some of the limitations of that. So, yeah. No further questions, let's ask. thank our speaker again. Uh, we're taking this speaker to lunch. Anybody wants to join us, they're welcome. Where are you going to lunch at? Um, we usually go to Cafe de Vance over here.